in Africa's oldest game reserve. One of its most threatened species finds safety. During a long drought, they have suffered under the beating sun. But late fall rains bring relief to rolling hills and broad savannas. As the landscape is refreshed, life is rejuvenated in all its forms. This is Hochlue Imfolozi Park. last stronghold of the rhino. It's late fall in Klochlue Imfolozi Park. Until recently, drought gripped the land, but unseasonably late rains have finally brought relief. Muddy wallows and water holes pepper the landscape. At one such wallow, a white rhino mother has been indulging in a cooling bath with her calf. Now she scrapes the mud off her remarkable horn. It's made up entirely of keratin, the same material that makes up human fingernails. And it could grow up to five feet long. A misguided belief that it has remarkable medicinal properties means that she is at risk of being killed for it. In South Africa alone, poachers have killed more than a thousand rhinos each year since 2013. But the park has an elite unit of highly trained anti-poaching personnel ready to fight for her survival. Helicopters routinely rumble overhead, patrolling the park to keep an eye on its inhabitants. And warn off any potential poachers. The recent battle against poaching is just the latest development in this park's rich and successful history of rhino conservation. When it was first established, the park saved the white rhino from the brink of extinction. For early European settlers, rhinos became one of the most sought after trophies to hunt in Africa. By the late 1800s, fewer than 100 southern white rhinos remained in the wild. In 1895, they were handed a lifeline in the form of the Chlochlue and Umfolozi reserves. The first areas in Africa officially protected under colonial rule. Lying in the heart of Zululand in the east of South Africa, the two parks are now merged as one 350 square mile reserve. The park takes its name from three major rivers flowing through it, the Chlochlue in the north 
and the black umphalosi and white umphalosi in the south. Covering the traditional hunting ground of the great Zulu king, Shaka, this wildlife haven boasts a fantastic array of habitats and animals. To the north, great hills rise above deep valleys. To the south, broad riverbeds carve through the land. Between these stretch undulating open savannas. In this varied and beautiful park, white rhinos found sanctuary, and their numbers grew. Alongside them, a great variety of life calls this park home, from Africa's most iconic creatures to the tiny, toiling away unseen. This is the latest chapter of the story of life in Africa's oldest park. In the warming morning sun, the birds are the first to stir. While they have a peaceful start to the day, Others are busier. Fall is breeding season for impala. And competition is the order of the day. These bachelors are too young to challenge mature rams for territories and mates and they spend the rut as a small separate herd. Like all young males, they're eager to flex their growing muscles and measure their strength against each other. ram flees and the victor takes seniority in the herd. As the remaining two rams square up, their roughhousing is cut short. It's the dominant ram and he's had enough of their child's play. For him, there's a lot more at stake this breeding season than for the youngsters. He controls a territory and a herd of potential mates. But keeping everything in order is no easy task. The females are playing hard to get and he has to repeatedly herd them back onto his turf. Another male approaches, and the ram quickly sends him running. He won't tolerate competitors. shows his anger with roaring snorts. A 
As if keeping control isn't enough, a group of yearlings seems intent on provoking him. Like a gang of excitable teenagers, they add to the commotion. To the male, this is serious business. He spends up to a quarter of his time obsessively guarding his territory and females. But eventually, he gets a chance to enjoy a bit of breakfast. The Impala Ram may work hard to control what's his, but he's a far cry from being lord of this land. That title belongs to an old lion that's on the move through his kingdom. His roars reverberate through the valleys, alerting his pride to his whereabouts. His wounded face tells the tale of a recent battle for dominance. The old male is in a coalition with three younger lions who are brothers. Together, they control these hills and the pride of females living here. Unlike the impala, which are spurred into action by the rains, lions have no set breeding season. This female is in heat. She solicits the attention of one of the young males. but the pair is rudely interrupted. The brothers and the older male work together, and they all share mating rights. For a couple of days, the female will mate more than twice an hour, and the first male will likely get another turn. If all goes well, she will give birth to the next generation of lions in about three and a half months. While some of the park's animals are preoccupied with mating, others look to take advantage of the renewed abundance of water. In the valley, a herd of Birchall zebra is heading for a morning drink. Until recently, the drought forced the herd toward a handful of water sources, making their movements predictable to predators. The rains have filled many dry pans meaning more choice and less chance of running into lions. Nevertheless, mothers are constantly alert, scanning their surroundings with eyes and ears. The mares and youngsters lead the way. while the stallion brings up the rear.
there's time to enjoy a good scratch along the way. The foal's fluffy coat protects it against the chill of the late fall morning. But under the hot African sun, things don't stay cool for long. As the day heats up, a herd of African buffalo heads toward another of the park's newly formed muddy pans. They're in no rush and feed as they go. A wide row of incisors helps crop even the toughest of grasses. But for now, they enjoy the sweet, tender growth after the recent rains. For the buffaloes, pests and parasites are part of life. Ticks feed on their blood, gathering in their ears and around their eyes. The buffaloes get some help from oxpeckers that eat the parasites. But like all good medicine, they're not always happily received. Luckily, the buffaloes have another remedy for the pest problem. Mud. The filthier they get, the better, especially in those hard-to-reach places. The mud forms layers around the pests, making it easier for the buffaloes to scratch them away. It's a cure-all. Even in winter, temperatures can top 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The wet earth cools the skin and works as a sunscreen. While most of the herd wallows, some males take the chance to test their strength and establish ranks. Only high-ranking bulls will get the chance to mate. This female is coming into heat. A senior bull sticks by her side to guard her from the interests of other males. She's not quite ready to mate. If he hopes to sire more offspring, He'll have to stay by her side until she's receptive. But he has other concerns. Two foreign bulls have arrived, and they're impressive specimens. One makes the most of a wallow he has all to himself. He's altogether too comfortable for the liking of the old bull, who has enough competition in the herd as it is. He moves over with plodding intent, but is in no rush to fight. Instead, he throws down the gauntlet, buffalo style, by assaulting a thorn bush. Unwilling to take up the challenge, the strangers move slowly off.
His dominance secured, the old bull rejoins his herd as they move off to continue their day. For the park's most famous species, herd dynamics are far less complicated. This bull spends much of his life alone. With his huge horn and impressive bulk, he's a force to be reckoned with, and he's the only male allowed to mate with females in his territory. But even the mightiest of rhinos isn't impervious to pests. Or sunburn. A mud bath will soon be in order. Close by, a mother and calf are already on the move toward the nearest wallow. The cow's investment in her calf began with a 15-month gestation and will continue for at least a year of suckling. With a well-armed one-and-a-half-ton mother watching over her, the calf strides through the bush at ease. When they find the mud they're looking for, they waste no time getting dirty. In a year or two, when the mother gives birth to her next calf, she may reject this youngster. But some stay with their mothers long after the birth of younger siblings. Further south, a remarkable family of rhinos grazes on the hillside. The mother and her youngest live with the calf's elder siblings. They're a special pair. Almost all rhinos give birth to only one offspring, but these two are twins, a male and a female. They live together happily for now, but soon enough the twins will leave to forge lives of their own. With her horn just beginning to develop, the youngest has more time left with her protective mother. The rains have provided plenty of new growth for the family. It takes a lot of food to fuel these big animals. And what comes in must go out. Territorial males frequent specific points in their territory to leave their dung in large heaps known as middens. In this midden, some of the park's smallest creatures are taking advantage of an opportunity. A colony of ants is out to collect food to last them the winter. They've found giant grubs in the dung. They slowly pull the prey apart to be carried away to underground nests. They aren't the only insects preparing for the cold months ahead. A colony of harvester termites is hard at work too. They carry and drag blades of grass into their nest. Work 
work rate is relentless. The most industrious climb the grass stalks and cut through sections with their strong mandibles. Pieces that fall are quickly collected and carried home. Working like this, harvester termites can remove almost half a ton of forage per acre of land. The grass will be moved to storage chambers deep below ground to feed the colony for the rest of winter. While the harvester termites carry grass down, their neighbors are busy building up. These fungus harvesting termites are constructing a metropolis. As the cold season sets in, they add an above ground section to their home, closer to the warmth of the sun. The rising water level has softened the soil underground and the termites carry the building material to the surface from as deep as 30 feet. It's a monumental team effort. Exposing themselves is risky. Ants stream to the surface from their nearby nest and they're on a murderous mission, picking off the termites. Despite the commotion, the termites toil away with no concern for their own safety. With winter on its way, there's no time to pause and reinforcements arrive from below to continue the labor. With this dedication and hard work, the colony will add to its home year after year. Eventually, after around 30 years of additions and renovations, it could reach the size of this mega home. As evening sets in, the termites retreat below ground, where they will be warm. They'll renew their work tomorrow. A new day brings with it more wet weather. Clouds blow in, shrouding the park in gray. On the undulating woodland savanna of the park's southern reaches, four male white rhinos graze in the breeze. None of them is big enough to challenge the area's territorial bull, and they stick together for company. Adult rhinos are immune to predation, 
but they're still naturally wary creatures. With poor eyesight, they can see for only around 130 feet. They make up for this with their fantastic sense of smell and satellite-like ears that move independently to hear the slightest sound. But wind interferes with sounds and blows away smells. Even a group of four mammoth males is skittish on a day like today. For the impala rams, the chilly weather is something of a blessing. There's little frantic chasing today as the herd lies low, taking shelter from the breeze between thick stands of bush. While they wait out the weather, they feed, eating both grass and leaves. To help digest their cellulose-rich food, impala chew the cud. They swallow a mouthful, regurgitate it, and continue to chew. While the females and youngsters eat, the ram in charge is typically preoccupied. Mating is the only thing on his mind. He moves methodically from female to female. But none is interested in his advances. He even checks the herd's youngsters, but they will only be ready to conceive next season when they're a year and a half old. The wait continues. In the late afternoon, the clouds deliver on their threats. Rain falls in a deluge across the park, adding to the water holes and pans. While other creatures seek cover, an African spoonbill enjoys an afternoon meal. He spends much of his life wading through water and is unperturbed by the downfall. Spoonbills are usually seen in groups of three or more, and he's cashing in on the unusual chance at a private feast. bill, he snaps up anything edible. The spoon bill will enjoy his banquet until he takes to the trees to roost for the night. Another morning reveals the northern foothills shrouded in mist. The sun is unimpeded by clouds, promising a hot day to come. But 
butterflies revel in its re-emergence. They will have plenty of nectar to drink today. But they should be careful if they want to avoid becoming breakfast themselves. web spider has built the perfect trap for insects. Its large web is anchored between a tree and bushes low to the ground. Golden orb weavers spin remarkably strong webs. This death trap is sturdy enough to catch small birds, although the spider couldn't eat such accidental prey. She is huge. Her abdomen alone measures almost an inch and a half. A trail of insect parts hangs ominously. This morning, it's an unlucky fly that falls into her trap. It's immediately stuck. She bides her time before making her move. It may not be a big meal, but as long as her web lasts, there will be plenty more to come. But with destructive giants around, a lasting web isn't a sure thing. A lone elephant bull moves slowly through the thicket. The rain has painted the park's trees green with new growth. And he takes full advantage. He tears off whole branches and munches them down thorns and all. His strong, dexterous trunk is the perfect tool for stripping branches. He barely needs to move his huge head. A fully grown bull can eat up to 660 pounds a day. Elephants have one of the most inclusive diets of all herbivores, and almost all plants are on the menu. And they're not the only ones with specialized tools for feeding. At 17 inches long, a giraffe's prehensile tongue is the perfect tool for plucking leaves from trees. Standing up to 18 feet tall, giraffes evolve to reach leaves that other animals can't. Today, they're feeding from the tops of bushes. Apart from when they drink, this is usually as low as they'll stoop. there's something in the grass that's worth bending down for. It's the bones of another animal, a valuable calcium supplement for a creature with a huge skeleton. The 
the giraffe's tongue isn't meant for maneuvering the awkward snack. Eventually, it can grind away some of the bone between its molars. And before long, it's got its fix. The young giraffe male will eventually lose the tufts on his horns, like the old bull in the herd. He uses his short horns in battles for dominance, wearing them bald at the tips. His dark coat is a sure sign of a bull in his prime. One of the herd's females is in estrus, and he's not leaving her side. As the herd moves off, he follows her doggedly, as he'll do for as long as it takes for her to accept his advances. Zebra and giraffe's fur coats protect them from the sun's harsh rays. But like rhinos, elephants have no such protection. At another of the park's mud wallows, the young elephant bull arrives for a cooling splash. His trunk is the perfect tool for all jobs. including spraying himself with mud. Another bull soon arrives. This is a popular cooling off point and in time, a whole breeding herd arrives. The mud wallow is a place of pure indulgence and enjoyment, especially on a hot afternoon. But while the giants head for water, others head for higher ground. A family of baboons climbs into the highest hilltops. The air is cooler up here, but that's not the main attraction. They've come to feast on the tall grasses that grow in these highlands. Baboons feed on a wide variety of plant and animal foods, but grass can make up more than half of their diets. The new seeds are a treat worthy of the long climb. They're sticky so the fussy baboons move with tails delicately raised to avoid too much matted hair. A sentry sits high in the trees, keeping an eye out for danger so the troop can eat at ease. They all settle down to enjoy the meal which includes side dishes of leaves and bark. When things get itchy, it helps to have four long limbs. With opposable thumbs, the baboons can pick and choose which part of each plant they want to eat.
for a white rhino and her calf, things are different. They use their wide, flat lips to bite off big mouthfuls, but not any grass will do. They rely on short, tender growth. The recent rains have carpeted Khlohuwe's hills in sweet new grass, so there's plenty of suitable fodder. Here, in the place that saved their very species from extinction, they can roam the hills together in peace. For a species under constant threat from poachers, things are looking dire. With around 5% of the total population being killed every year. But in this park, with its rich conservation history, there is hope for these gentle giants. In time, the calf will leave his mother's side to father offspring of his own and produce the next generation to roam these hills. But for now, his mother finally gives in to his begging and settles down to let him suckle. Tomorrow will be another day for the rhinos and all the other creatures that live with them sharing this remarkable park.